Hi, I'm Guy Berry with Optimistic American, and this is our book club. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the book, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. This book actually uh, caught some fame. It was featured on the Oprah show in the early 2000s and uh, has stayed around in the business community as a great book, and it's easy to read. Uh, it's actually a two-hour audio book, so if you speed it up, you can get it to about an hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My guest today is Mike Bechtel. So, Mike, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, guy. Happy to be here. Um, okay, so the Four Agreements. Um, this is a book that Don uh, Miguel Ruiz has studied. The Toltec, um, which is a civil, ancient civilization from Mexico, um, I believe it was around 700 AD uh, that this civilization existed. But they had a way of doing things, and he studied this, and then he's created a couple of books from it. Four Agreements is one of them. And um, just overall, like, what is your overall assessment of the book before we dive into it and how you've used it? Just how has it helped you in your life? Yeah. So I think either yourself or, or uh, Dave Berg introduced it to me. Um, really easy read. So but resonated a ton with me in the way that I want to live my life. So I've I've loved it. I've read it countless times now. Right. It's become probably at least a once a month. Um, knowing it so well, again, you can do it on like two and a half speed and it's a 40 minute listen. Um, but yeah, I think it's been helpful in being better to myself, being better to my family, being better to colleagues and, and people that work with me and for me. Um, just overall, it's, it's a great resource to go back to a lot. I mean, if you have a 20 minute commute to work, you're getting through the book in a week or two. I'm just listening to it normal speed. Oh, I mean, yeah. Like, Easy. You know, like, so, um, what, what do you say about, okay, so there's people that have this, like, uh, negative notion around maybe um, meditating or the, like, softer side of things. And this book could be seen as a little meditative type book, but um, you, know, you don't strike me as somebody who's very into meditation. <laughs> <not> so, meditate. <laughs> um, so what do you think of that? Like, because there might be people who are, who start to get into it and go, wow, this is a little like hokey for me. Cause it's very, it is a very me meditative type book, yogi yeah. yoga book. Yeah. And I don't, I don't meditate. Um, I, I have a hard time with that always. And maybe I, I think through things, but maybe you call that meditation. Um, you know, I've, uh, as I listened to it this week again, a couple of times, actually it, it brought me to like, it does, um, tie into a lot of other things we do in our life. So I don't know that it's like, if you think about, well, I like to do like strategic thinking or I like to journal or I like to meditate or yoga, there's principles that tie to all of that, yep. right? Whether it's, you know, personal, religious, like your beliefs on politics, whatever it is, it can tie into the way this thinking is, which is why I think it's um, was so powerful for so many people. It wasn't like designed for one right. specific group. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so let's get in the book. Um, it starts off with the domestication of the dream and the dream of the planet. And um, really what this, what this starts with is when you're born, you didn't choose the language that you started speaking. Your parents or the people around you, you know, started to train you on that or the church you went to or the community you were around. All these things started creating a community of beliefs that you bought into that became your dream that you at some point maybe felt like this isn't really who I am, but I'm being told by everybody, this is how I'm supposed to be. And this first part really introduces the notion of, okay, you're going to need the four agreements to get out of this dream. And in the book, um, this, they, they relate it to a brain fog that is over your brain. And, um, the Toltec called it a mitote, which is a marketplace which would be similar to like a marketplace where everybody speaks a different language and nobody can understand each other. It's just a very loud yeah. place with people speaking and nobody can understand each other. And then, um, and then they speak in the book that uh, India has a name for this, which is a, a Maya, which is an illusion. And the illusion is around I am. So I have an illusion about who I am. And um, so talk to me about this notion that we're living in a dream 
um, created by everybody else. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I mean, the way he starts it and um, how he, like he's talking in like a third person, how someone comes out of it. But you think about like, I've got five kids, you know, you've got two and people that have kids or we think about when we grew up and we had these like great imaginations. Um, it, the example that I always go back to is like driving a car on a wall, right? You drive it on the wall, you drive it on the roof. At some point you're told no, right? Well, that's not how it works. Don't do that. And you either keep doing it or you're at, you believe that you don't drive cars on walls, right? And cars aren't meant to drive on ceilings. And it breaks that just belief of, you know, maybe, maybe not truth, but just that this idea of being creative and, and out there. And um, so we create these rules and we don't create them. I, I guess we do. Our mind creates them, but it goes into that metote or that fog because we can't see through, we can't see past that to what is actually really truth because we've been either brought up by parents, culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about, um, like I lived in Portugal for two years. They do things a lot different there. Um, right across the border of Spain, even different, right? Dylan's in Kenya right now. My son's in Kenya and the stuff he shares, it's like, that's just the way they do things. Right. And so kids are brought up that way. And then we, those become our belief systems that, uh, we have to break, right. Which is where he brings, introduces like, here's the way to break these beliefs that we put in ourselves. Well, and you, and you think about it, like children, when they're playing and they're being imaginative, smiles on their face, happy and then go walk into an average company not not the company we work at because <laughs> yeah. we we see a lot of smiles on the people we in do, our company yeah. but it, it, average company you walk into not many people are smiling they're, they're very serious right so when when children are asked to like draw what does an adult look like they typically don't draw them with a smile on their face right because yeah. they're they're used to seeing them working and walking around and they've lost a sense of that innocence and that's over all these years and time of being told what to do and how to how to act, how to be like, think if you were at your like the example you just gave, then you went to uh, your your work and you started just taking a toy car and driving it around on the walls and the ceiling. People would look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. They'd be like, what are you doing? Yeah. And you could be like, I'm just having fun. This is fun. I'm not I'm playing with a toy car. and This is what I want to do right now. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that... it's now looked at as like a negative. Yeah. You got to grow up. You got to be an adult. And even the idea of the kids, like when kids, kids will be playing and, and I've seen it with your kids and my kids and other kids that come in, they're instantly best friends, which like adults don't do. You don't just go sit down and then all of a sudden you guys are, we're not running from place to place, enjoying right. life. It's, um, and when kids play an adult, what happens to them? They stop smiling, yeah. right? I think the book gives the example of a lawyer. It's like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer. And then all of a sudden it's a frown, a serious <laughs> face. Um, even if kids are like, okay, I'm going to, we're going to play house. I'll be dad. And then the dad's this stern, like that's their belief of how it should be. And, um, that's tough, right? I don't, I don't like that. So that's why I think the book, I really enjoy the book because I constantly am trying to break those, you know, beliefs that I have either I built myself or others have for me, but. And it creates boundaries, right? If you think about it, kids have very limited boundaries, meaning they, their imagination goes yeah. wild because they believe anything could happen. Anything, you know, anything could you know, like my, my daughter right now is talking about how she's going to be flying in space and go to all these other planets and she's going to do stuff because in her mind, that's going to be doable. And like, you know, there hasn't been any yeah. actual discussions of like, how realistic is it? And it's not on me as a parent to be to say, oh, you can't do that. Right. No, believe it. Believe whatever you yeah. want. And then let's let's see what happens. Right. Yeah. I mean, you think about when we were kids, if we if we told our parents, like, I want to be able to uh, talk to grandma on the TV and and see your face and talk back and forth. Our parents have been like, yeah, you can't do that. Right. And now look at it. It's so like, yeah, that's normal. But somebody who knows to, what's coming. Somebody had to dream it and believe it. Right. Um, okay. So now we got to get out of the dream. He starts to go through the four agreements. The first agreement is the most important one, which is be impeccable with your word. And I, I will say that I struggle with this one, but it's one of those that you got to remember it's there. Right. And the example that sticks with me out of the book, and especially as a parent, um, is there's a daughter who is singing and jumping on the bed, and the mom's had a headache all day, and she's just been struggling with it. And so she tells her, well, you just shut up. Your voice is terrible anyways. And she didn't mean that, but it just came out because she's had a headache all day. Her daughter won't stop singing, and now the daughter grows up for the rest of her life never wanting to sing. 
because she heard from her mom who she looks up to and has faith in and believes in that she doesn't have a pretty voice. And so now it's just, it's done. Like she's, she's never going to sing again. That's how, that's how powerful the word can be. Um, obviously he brings up, um, you know, that there was one person in Germany who created yeah. heinous acts from just word, from just using words yeah. and, um, how powerful that can be. So, um, What's your what's your assessment of being impeccable with the word? Yeah, and I think um, I like the way they break down impeccable, right? So pecar is to sin, and so sin is really the way he describes it is anything we do against ourselves that's not natural. Mm -hmm. So it, and the M is without it. So you're doing um, basically removing anything that would go contrary to yourself, and that that's you know words, and and we see a lot. I mean, you you say things to your kids, to family members, which it's interesting, and I take it out of the book all the time, is we do it to the ones we love the most. Like, that's the ones we hurt the most with the words, um, yeah. which is strange, right? You think you wouldn't do that, um, but we do. And so the that's a hard one. He, he says that's the hardest one, right? Yeah. And you got he uses the other ones to say, hey, you got to reset and, and do that. Um, I, we talk about it a lot, right? Like, and he talks about the black gossip, like the black magic is yep. the bad, using the word for negative, because it can be used for positive. Yep. Um, like today I said, Hey, great haircut and happy birthday. Thank you. Those were positive words, but yeah, I felt good about it. You can do it in a negative way too. And, and shift it, and, you know, um, but yeah, I, I, it, that's a tough one for me. Cause I think I naturally will say things and I look back and I'm like, I could have done that a lot better. Like how did it land versus how I said it? One that probably you and I need to do better on and I just knowing you, I'm saying that you probably do is that he talks about how animals are, the, oh, gosh, li yeah. you know, just move on. They, they don't have memory where they keep beating themselves up. So if an animal makes a mistake, it learns from the mistake done. We keep punishing ourselves in our own head. Oh yeah. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe whatever. And we relive that moment. And that is part of that being impeccable with your words, even with yourself, where don't just beat yourself up over and over and over again. Every time you think yeah. about that time you made a mistake or messed up, if you just keep bringing it back up in your own mind, you're just, you're really hurting yourself. Um, but he also uses the example of like how often it is where you do something wrong and then your spouse says something and then your kid says something and then somebody else says yeah. something. And like, we just like all just get over, just and, over. over and over <laughs> again and it just brings you down. And so um, I, I find that interesting, especially that part of just your own internal like be impeccable the word, even with yourself, like give forgiveness to yourself yeah. so that you can move on and not just keep beating yourself up. And it is one I struggle with. And I know, like, I think he says the example is humans are the only ones that do this. Right. And, and he says, we'll suffer thousands of times for a mistake we made um, and thousands of other times from the people around us. That's where he brings the loved ones as yeah. typically it's a loved one that's reminding us of how crappy we are. <laughs> um, and, you know, we do it to other people too. So, yep. so it's a checkpoint, I think, to say like, Hey, you know, it's not, what good is that doing me? Yep. You know, and hard though. I mean, that's, I think that again, it ties into the next ones to go, how do you get past that? Right. right. Like what's an actionable way to not do that. And that was, you know, being impeccable with your word, definitely most important. And he says, if you can master this one, you're, you're, you're really far on your journey. The next one is, the second agreement, which is don't take anything personally. And he says, if you master the first two, these first two, you've, you've accomplished 75% yeah. of what you need to do. Um, so now it's don't take anything personally. And part of don't take anything personally is realizing that because other people have now lived in this dream, then you got to be able to let go. Like if somebody calls me an idiot, I got to be like, well, that's how they were raised. They were raised that they were okay to just call somebody an idiot I can't, I can't take that personally. It doesn't mean anything to me because I had no control of how they were raised, their beliefs. Yeah. And, and that one can be a struggle for people. Um, you know, in the book, it does go into the aspect of even if you were abused or other things, how you can try to let go because you, you can't take anything personally. Um, but what's your thoughts on that one? Yeah, and I, I like that one too. And the hard part is trying to remember that everybody was raised different. You don't know what's going on in their life, right? There's sometimes people like honking at me at a red light. And I'm like, where am I supposed to go? Calm down. But I don't know what's going on, right? Who yeah. knows what they're rushing to or what's happening? Um, 
and he goes to a very extreme, right? He says, even if someone puts a gun to your head and pulls the trigger, don't take it personal. It was nothing personal. Like right. they, they are going through something that you don't know. Um, it's hard though, right? I, I, I struggle with it. And I, I tend to like either in this or, or maybe in, in another agreement, he talks about like you wake up and you've kind of got this limit of mental, emotional capacity and it, it gets drained. Sometimes it gets drained because maybe someone's saying stuff to you and you're trying to not take it personal and then you lose it. And he's like, go reset, you know, take a minute. You're not going to be perfect every time. You're not going to, you're going to take it personal, but go reset. And then the next time don't, um, which is really what life is, right? Like that's where it's how it is. Yeah. And I mean, it goes to the aspect of it's, if somebody does something to you, right? Whether it's physical harm, emotional harm, um, that if it's, if you take it personally, you're actually somewhat selfish. You're saying, Oh yeah, this is about me. This is about myself versus no, this is just about them. This is about who they are and has nothing to do with me. I don't need to make, I'm, I'm actually the one making it about me by letting it affect me by having a negative. I'm being selfish saying, thinking that the world revolves around me and these things happening to me are because of me versus you know what when things happen to me that's because that's stuff out of my control i can't control other people i can't control what they say i can't control what they do um and you gotta be able to let go and yeah. that's a challenge yeah yeah I, I like that part where he said uh it's a selfish act so, you know to take it personal it becomes selfish because it's like the world revolves around me and it's it's not that way right no so then he moves to the third agreement, which is don't make assumptions and, um, you know, uses an example of even being at a shopping, you know, you're out shopping, you look over and maybe I see a woman who smiles at me and I think in my head, man, then she's going to want to go on a date with me. She's mm-hmm. going to want to go do this. And I go down this whole path based off of an assumption and I've just lived this whole dream all in an assumption. And, um, you know, in the world of social media, if we just took the three agreements we just talked yeah. about between being impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, and now assumptions, there's a lot of assumptions happening with people in social media right now when yeah. it's, oh, look at how happy they are. Look at all the posts there. You know, this is happening. Mm-hmm. That's happening. Lots of assumptions. But um, what uh, sticks with you out of don't make any assumptions? Yeah, I mean, I think assuming is you, you never know someone's mindset. You never know what they're thinking or going through. And so we we do it very naturally. Um, and the, I, I like the point you said, you know, like the husband comes home from work and maybe the wife's mad or, the, or, or vice versa, right? A spouse comes home and the other spouse is mad and you just don't know why. And you can assume and, um, you know, like maybe you go do the dishes and you think that fixed the problem. But there's something else going on. So he says asking questions to get clarity is always a good thing yep. because you're never going to assume, you know, the answer, which also goes back to being very selfish. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to assume I know it. And that's a selfish thing. Like, I don't know, just ask like, well, what's going on? Cause right. maybe it's not about the dishes, right? Maybe yeah. it's not about the, there's that video about the nail in the head. You remember that one? Mm-hmm. Like it's not about the nail. There's other things that are yeah. going on. So don't, don't assume. Yeah. And, and, and then the part that, um, I've heard a couple of times when I go back and, and re-listen to this book, but I forget is also don't make assumptions in ourselves, right? So yeah. sometimes we actually go, oh, I'm going to make this decision because like, I know this is right. Okay, stop. Ask the questions of yourself of why do you know this is right? Like go through yeah. it. Don't make the assumption even within your own self of what you're doing. And, um, because it's not just about like, am I making assumptions externally, but it's even internal as well. Yeah. And uh, I'm somebody who makes very quick decisions and I could use a little pause, yeah. ask questions. Okay, am I making the right decision here? Or am I just assuming that like, I know what's right, you know? Yeah, tie, and you tie it back to the way we were raised and the belief systems we were brought up in is sometimes those assumptions we make are will be wrong because of those things. So That's right. Don't, don't assume you're right because... Maybe you were brought up to believe something different. Right? You, you, you nailed it, right? Like it's, we've, <laughs> we have a whole belief system that's been created with us. That's only, so like, where were you, where were you born? San Francisco. Sa- San Francisco. I'm born in Austin, Texas. Um, then you went to college where? BYU. And then I went to college at Baylor, both religious schools, different, yeah. re- different uh, religions. Um, and then let's see, when did you move to Arizona? Uh, 2007. 
Okay, so you moved actually here same year I did. I yeah. moved here in 2007. So we've, um, so the, but our journeys from Utah, California to Arizona, I'm Texas to Arizona. We have completely different standards of how we were raised. Yeah. And, and we're going to put a, a boundary or picture around our decisions and the things we do based off that, right? So how mm-hmm. you answer a question or how you do something is going to be different than me which again goes back to then I shouldn't assume that I have the right answer or I shouldn't assume this is the right next step. I should ask questions about why do I think that because of my belief system? Is it because of the way I was raised or is it because I've got actual facts in front of me of what I need to do next? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I bet just, just to guess that you don't have the state of Texas of any type of decoration <laughs> in your house. I do not. No. Okay. All right. No. I have the state of Texas I've, as a decoration in my it. house. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't have the state of California or Utah either because well, that's, that's a Texas thing, right? Like yeah. that's your culture you got brought up. Texas is the greatest state. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Outside of Arizona. It's a good assumption. Though. Arizona. Arizona. <laughs> um, so uh, the book then goes into the fourth agreement, which is the tie a bow on the rest, which is always do your best. And if you, you know, really it is the action of the first three agreements is always doing your best and going back and practicing and even knowing that my best might be 5%, right? Like if I am sick, I don't feel good, then do my best. What do I have that day? What can I do that day? If I mess up and I don't, and I'm not impeccable with my word, do my best to be better the next time. I mean, that's what I love about this book is it's it's giving you the tools to say, hey, you're going to fail at some of these things. You're going to, that happens. We're human. Then do your best to figure out how to move forward. Um, so how has always doing your best, how how do you put that into your life? Yeah. And, and I use it, you know, as we're talking, I think as I read it this week, it, it was more self-reflection. I use it outwardly a lot. Like I tell people like, um, you know, people are like, oh, you always have to give 100%. Well, you always don't have it, right? Like, but you give 100% of what you have that day. So if, you know, you have 5%, give the 5% then. Don't sell it short, give 3%. Um, and I tell my team that a lot here. I'll say, you know, if, if you're coming in and whatever's going on, there's distractions from family, from outside, from, you know, the Warriors lost on Wednesday night, whatever it is. Um, and, and I've got 70% to give, well, I better give 70%, right? Don't, don't give 60% and, and mail it in. Um, but if you do, and that's where I think he's talking about at this point, he says, you know, the husband and wife wake up, they have a big argument at breakfast and then he's exhausted. It's yeah, go, go sit down, go relax, reset, and then go at the day with what you have and, and always do that. Um, when you tie them all together. And again, he said the first two agreements, the impeccable and the, um, the the don't, don't take it personal. personal those are those will change most of your life if you can do those but you're doing your best is is actually an easy one because it's just in that moment give what you have right that's all you can do i don't think the warriors gave what they had I mean, they lost they were uh they just, i took it that? personal yeah i, I was not impeccable at the tv yeah <laughs> that was a lot probably, of things that day you probably didn't give it, it, the right words to your TV. You probably took it personally that yeah. it was about you. I assume they didn't care about me. And you assume yeah. that they didn't care about you for not winning the game. Oh yeah. I was pissed. All right. They're out. I got over it. Okay. I'm glad you got over it. The um, book then wraps up with just the Toltec path to freedom and the new dream, which is really about how do you move forward and live now that you're working with these four agreements. And then it wraps up with a prayer at the end of the book, which um, really actually I've used it. It's about eight minutes great little like as you're coming into the office if you have a rough start to your morning or whatever yeah. you can do this uh quick little prayer uh piece where it just it just talks about breathing and listening to your uh lungs as you're, as you're breathing um so it's almost meditative but yeah. um you know this book here's what i say i i've recommended it to a lot of people anybody who uh i've recommended to who's read it has enjoyed it has applied some piece to it in their life um, and for me, uh, I, I constantly want to go back and re listen to it and re go yeah. through it because I pick up something new or it reminds me. And, and sometimes it, it, it's going, you know, always doing your best, you know, you might start doing well, then you kind of get, get back and then you go back and it's just this roller coaster. and re going back and doing the book. It's so easy to go back through it. It just refreshes me. And, um, you know, it's just, it is a very impactful book if you, if you use some of these tools. 
Yeah, and I think the end, what I like, what, one thing is each time I read it, I pull a little something different out of it just based on what I'm going through. So it hits a little different. And then um, as you practice the four agreements, you start to see people differently too. You're less judgmental, you're more compassionate, you're more caring, you're more understanding because you realize like, well, this is how they were brought up. And so you, you see them different. I think he talks about like in, in this dream, he sees people and he sees light, right? And the light he sees is love and it, it gets away from the, you know, the negative aspect of our lives into this idea of love. And that's the way we look at the world. I wish there was a four agreements filter with social media, right? Like we should <laughs> yeah. just like plug it in and then it'll help you. Yeah. Well, Mike, thanks for talking with me today. Yeah. I, I love this it. book. I love man. it too. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening today uh, for The Optimistic American and the book, The Four Agreements. This book has really been impactful in my life, and I hope you enjoyed listening to our podcast today. Any comments, please put them in there. We'll respond to them. Like it, subscribe. Have a great day. Thanks for joining The Optimistic American Show. Now help us grow by subscribing to our channel. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like and a comment. There is so much more that we have planned. We can't wait for you to embark upon this journey with us.